Hello everyone, I'm Josh Oaks, and here you're listening to the medialeaders.com podcast where we do so much with companies to talk to them about how to build a great company culture first and foremost. What is your why? What are your processes, procedures? And then once you have that, how can we work with your employees so that they're thriving? And a lot of that is thriving online so that then they, your company can shine online, can shine in person. And it really starts from that, what is your company believe in? How do they operate that company culture? I'm honored here today on this podcast to have an absolute American hero. And I say that because I'm such a fan of his and the things that he's done for all of us. I have today Robert Cujo Teschner. He is a Lieutenant Colonel retired and he's a former fighter pilot in the F-15 and the F-22. Now, if you don't know what an F-22 is, please Google that. If I am correct, it is a single seater aircraft dual engine it does stuff that we're not even allowed to know about I, I, and i'm a i'm a massive fan of this aircraft even more of cujo here um sir thank you for joining us here today welcome to the podcast thank you so much for having me and thank you for one of the coolest introductions that i've ever had um it's so good to be here today and i really appreciate what it is that you're doing for businesses across the united states and the globe Real quick, I'm a nerd, but uh, tell me just real quick, both of these aircraft, that you got the chance to be pilot in command, if you will, PIC as they call it. Tell us about the F-22 real fast, uh, a little bit of the capabilities of that aircraft, because I want the business owners, the people here to see that you now as a leader who teach companies how to debrief to win, we're gonna get into that, everybody hang out for just a sec, how America's top guns practice accountable leadership and how you can too. But talk to us about this aircraft that you had. There, there's, no, there's no plane that trains you in it. You get in it one day and you're like, I, there's only one seat, which is kind of a big deal. Can you tell us about that for just a minute? Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's the, the equivalent that I can offer you is, is hopping into and strapping on a rocket ship. Yep. When you plug in the afterburner and you take off, uh, with those two magnificent engines, you've got a watch going supersonic on takeoff. And you've got so much thrust and so much capability built into this magnificent machine. And you've got to figure out how to manage it all and how to make smart decisions without having a pause button. There's no opportunity to kind of slow things down. Once you're, once you're going, you're going until you come back down and land. And it's a really interesting place to grow up. It's a really interesting place to learn how to lead because of the absence of being able to take a pause or a timeout, the decisions that you make have to be really high quality all the way through in order for you to achieve mission success. And that's what we're all about doing. And, and you can see from these images that you're, that you're showing here, what a, what a beautiful machine it is. What, you, what the pictures don't show you is how brilliantly it's engineered and how well it's put together. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, dual engine, single pilot, which is just right. unbelievable. Okay, enough of me being nerdy. <laughs> okay, um, but huge fan of what you do. You're going to give us three tips on how we can debrief to win in a company to, to be great leaders. And remember, everybody listening and watching this, to make sure that you are building a culture that's awesome. So without further ado, let's dive into what's tip number one. Well, tip number one is finding a way to consistently guard the honor that your company ought to be practicing always. And I think most of us, as we go into business, we have this vision of what our business is gonna do, what, what it is that we're gonna bring forth, who it is that we're gonna be, how it is that we're gonna serve. And that all of that sounds great, right up until the point where we start to grow in the process of growth. We hire a bunch of people who may not understand the original vision of where it is we're trying to go there. They have their own interpretations of what it is that we as leaders are looking for from them. And sometimes in that evolution, which can happen very, very fast, by the way, sometimes in the evolution, there's a disconnect between who we want to be and who we really are. Uh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a number of case studies that we could talk about. Just off the top of my mind, I think about, about Volkswagen, okay? Mm -hmm. So a storied company, long history, a long history of success, a strong brand name in the modern marketplace, bringing really high quality products to bear part of a conglomerate. So they're taking pieces of companies and taking the best from all of them and merging them and, and bringing that forward. But somehow along the way, 
there becomes a disconnect between how the lower level members of the organization are operating to meet the perceived expectations of the leadership. And the way that it manifests itself here in the United States is they're selling cars that don't meet the emission standards, but they found a way to get past um, the protocols to determine whether or not they meet the emission standards. They game the system, they trick the system, they lie. And yeah. where that works for a while, ultimately it comes falling apart in very, very short order. And now there's scandal and there's disappointment, there's market share loss, there's frustrations. You got people at the top of the organization that come, you know, falling down and all throughout there's a ripple effect. The problem that I see from my standpoint is, is that somewhere along the, the way that disconnect allowed their honor or their virtuous practices to fall apart. And the, the outcomes are, are, are pretty negative. What I think an advantage or an opportunity is of developing a debrief centered culture, it's to create, think if you think of like bowling terms, bumpers that prevent us from falling into the gutter, the proverbial gutter along the way, or guideposts to help us stay true to who it is that we envision ourselves being so that we manifest what it is that we as leaders ultimately are looking to do. And by the way, as an aside, to those who are wondering, what is this debrief that we're talking about? A simple definition of a debrief is a constructive evaluation of the quality of the decisions that we're making in relationship to what it is that we set out to achieve. And if we think about it that way, we're always constructively evaluating the quality of our decisions in relationship to what we're trying to do. It can provide us the guideposts we need to be who it is that we aim to be. Yeah, and just uh, as an aside as well, I've sat through some of your speeches and you talk about how a debrief is not just for when things go wrong. And in fact, we're if we're just using it for when things go wrong, then we're actually missing a tremendous amount of what we could do. So the Blue Angels, if I remember correctly, after every single one of their flights, which some of us, let's laymen like me, um, citizen, normal citizens or whatever you want to call it, call me, um, we would look at the Blue Angels and go, that's terrific, that's neat, but you fly the same thing all over the world every single day. What do you need to talk about, right? Actually, it's very important, as you taught me. Uh, they debrief every single time what went right, what exactly did we do on this turn, how close were we, because the lead uh, goes forward and everybody else is watching his, I mean, I, I have a lot of friends that are pilots, instructors, and I've, I've flown in formation and they're, they're very close and they're watching and they will debrief on everything that went perfect, everything that went mediocre, everything that went bad, which hopefully there's very few things that ever will go bad with them. Um, but be, by debriefing on the successes, they have a lot less failures because they're focusing on it. We talked a little bit about as well as John Wooden, anybody that's right now that's a leader in your organization. John Wooden, even though I went to the school that he did, that is the opposition school to him, he taught at UCLA, perhaps one of the best coaches in the world, basketball coach, one of the neatest men you've, you'll ever meet. Uh, uh, he taught people, he started out as a, as a coach, and I'm sorry for this story, Cujo, but he taught people instead of teaching basketball, start by putting your socks on and, and tying your shoes first. He said, we're gonna spend an hour learning how to tie our shoes and put our socks on. People thought he was crazy, but they won every single year because he started with everything to say, here's how to do this right, and he layered it on. Huge, huge hit. Um, okay, talk to us about tip number two. Yeah, so actually the, the, the story that you shared from Coach Wooden uh, combined with what it is that the, uh, the the Blue Angels do in their debriefs, it's it's all tied to this next point, and that is focusing on our behaviors and making sure that our behaviors support what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, in the in the case of the Blue Angels, which is a very simple case to examine, you're right; they're flying the exact same profile every single day, but there are subtle differences. Even though you're flying a loop. You might be flying a loop at sea level on one day, and then the, you, know, you go on the road and now you're flying at 6,000 feet. It has an effect on how the airplanes perform. It has an effect on how it is that you need to work your, your procedures. So while it looks from the external viewpoint like it's the exact same thing, those subtle differences can make a, a huge amount of difference in the safety of the maneuver and the effectiveness of the team. And if we don't, if we don't give credit to the fact that there are these minuscule differences each and every day that could have huge effects on us, well then we're missing, we're missing something important. 
in terms of our ability to consistently achieve outstanding performance. And the Blue Angels take that into account. And their behaviors are, they come into their post-mission debriefs and they're vulnerable. They lead with, the, their, their commander, their leader leads with vulnerability and says, hey, mm -hmm. this is what I screwed up. Here are the mistakes that I personally made and here's what I'm going to do to fix it. Yeah, they're highly self vulnerability yeah. from the top. That's great. And if you think about it, you know, and you, and you watch you watch movies, you watch uh, Hollywood's depiction of what life is like in a fighter squadron, typified probably best by Top Gun. Fantastic movie, 1986. The new one's coming out in December. It's exciting. You don't see much of that in the film. I'm here to report that even though we don't use the term vulnerability, our best instructors, the people that you want to learn from are the ones that are willing to step forward and say, here's what I screwed up, here's how I'm going to fix it, and I take ownership of the whole thing. And you work through uh, collaboration, being, being open to the fact that it's about the team, not about the individual. And it's as a team that we're going to succeed. That's really, really important. And translating what, it, what the team behaviors need to be in order to bring the best from our team, that's mission critical to us. Self-awareness, empathy, having a growth mindset and always practicing integrity. These are the behaviors that are absolutely essential to bring a debrief culture to life. If we don't bring the behaviors in and all we're doing is focusing on methodology, we're focusing on following a checklist, the checklist is never going to take root. The methodology is not gonna to come to life. It could even be, it could even lead to a poisonous type of environment where people use the accountability structure, this debrief, to attack each other or to lay blame or to focus on shaming people who have done something wrong. In a, in a high performing team setting, it's not about blame or shame. That's looking backwards and that's trying to attack. On a high performing team, our behaviors are tied to looking forward to being better tomorrow than we were today and improving constantly in, an, in a mindset of gratitude for the opportunity to be able to do so. And, and I think it's that focus on behaviors. If we think about translating whatever the values are that we believe are necessary to bring our company to life, into specific behaviors that we can measure, track, teach to, and evaluate, now we're onto something, and we're onto something that's going to make our companies a place where people want to work. Very true, and I think everybody who's listening or watching this, I, I tell everybody that's ever worked with me, I hope you have a least favorite boss, right? I use a different term, um, but but it, a, a boss that that you just go, what? Why does this person treat these people this way? Because typically they're not as vulnerable. Typically they're uh, angry or upset. They just don't know. They can't see the self awareness, as you put, as your line item number two. Not only are they not vulnerable from the top, and I'm not being negative. I'm just showing younger generation. I hope you have a terrible boss, because it makes you better. I have one. I love it. I've got a couple, and it makes me. Ne it's part of our core values. Is I'll never treat you this way. And I know what that feels like. It's not going to happen to you. I want to remind you there are people out there. If you want to go work for them, you're welcome to. But if you're here, you're going to get this. And you, but you got to work hard, right? And that's what I do want from you. So I think that's so important. Talk to us about tip number three you have on how we can debrief to win. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of business owners share with me is that the cultures that they've built or that they've been a part of, maybe they're a senior leader and have come into a culture that's been in existence for a while. Um, there is an accountability mechanism, but the accountability is typically practiced when there's been a failure. Hey, we just lost a huge client. Let's discuss it. Oh, we, we just lost a bunch of money doing something. We just had a safety mishap. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up coming from that is, is that we're not as conversant with the process of how to do whatever our accountability term is. And I, again, I advocate for this term debrief. We, can't, we don't do debriefs as well because we don't do them that frequently. So that's one of the challenges. The other piece is, if it's always about failure, then usually the outcomes are some manifestation of shame and blame. And really the enjoyment factor, the excitement factor about doing this is low. Think about the organizations that you've been a part of where the only time that you've come together to discuss you know, how it was that this thing took place was around a failure, it probably wasn't a good experience. And because we aren't well-versed in the behaviors that bring a debrief to life oftentimes, it can really, it can be painful. So we don't want to do them. Um, and so Cujo, we don't do them well. 
Tell us the story, please, about what happens when something went wrong in your group and how people would ha start with vulnerability. And I think it ended up in a bar. What, tell us what that, what that was. You told us a great story there. Right. So, um, so there, there are any number of things that can go wrong on a, on a fighter type mission. If you think about it, we're dealing with ordnance that kills. We're going really, really fast. You've got lots of planes in the sky. Mm -hmm. And when we're on the road, the implications are strategic. I mean, you can't fly into a, you know, a third party country. You, you just, the president can get involved. It's that kind of level of, of, of difficulty. And when we train, we train as realistically as we can to replicate what we're going to experience, um, you know, downrange in the real world. Even though we don't fire real missiles at one another, sometimes there can be an experience where you find yourself accidentally having potentially shot somebody or accidentally having dropped a bomb in the wrong target or having done something of similar import. We'll finish the mission by debriefing them. And in that debrief, everybody will be upfront about what it was that took place. We're very factual, we're truth-based. We bring the truth to life. In our analysis, we find the root cause of why it was that we won or lost. And in this case, if something really bad happened, we're gonna figure out why it is that, that we made the succession of mistakes that led to the outcome, because it's usually not a single thing. You're also gonna have a bunch of people that are coming forth saying, I'm taking ownership of this. And the leader is going to be the one that says, yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it, but I'm going to take over all ownership because accountability resides at my level. And we're going to craft a plan to avoid making that mistake again or that series of mistakes again. But that's not the end. Of it. On Friday, our ritual behavior is we get together as a tribe. Usually in a squadron bar setting, I think they're called uh, heritage rooms now in the Air Force, but we'll come together to tell stories from the week to celebrate the fact that we've made it through another week, to celebrate the victories of the week, but we'll also tell the stories of the, of the lessons that, we've, that we're in the process of learning. And if I'm the person that made the most egregious error in the mission where we had a bad outcome, um, I'm gonna talk about that in front of all of my peers, in front of any of our visiting pilots, any guests of the, of the squadron of the tribe. And I'll tell the story of what happened, how it was that we got there and what it is that we've allegedly learned. And I say allegedly learned because we really haven't, unless we've done something different, we've gone back forward and, and tried again and proved better. And then I'll offer a gift to the squadron as a sort of a token of, you know, my, um, my awareness of the mistake that I made and the implications to the tribe as a whole. And once I've offered my token, uh, the, the squadron is going to toast me and say, we appreciate you for this. And it's a very open, very vulnerable, but incredibly uplifting and positive experience as part of our rituals. So there's that, which builds the psychological safety necessary to have honest conversations with one another. And then there's the ritual that says, we're not done with the process until we've debriefed it. If the outcome was great, awesome. We're gonna debrief it to validate that we won because of us. And if the outcome wasn't great, awesome. We're going to debrief it to figure out why we didn't get the desired outcome so that we can make adjustments so we can win tomorrow. It's our ritual. It happens regardless. And because of that, because it's both for the positives and for the negatives, because it's always happening, it's ingrained. It almost feels like the day is not complete until we've had the debrief. And because of this ritual, it's not difficult. Because it's a ritual, there's always time for it. And ultimately, it just happens and we're constantly improving without even thinking about it. I love that. And you've made it positive, right? If you're vulnerable, we're going to cheers to you. One of the things that, that you guys are pushing, because you told me in past stories is, hey, cheers to you. We're about the team. Cheers to the team is what you're really saying. And you're a part of that team. And we come together to fix that, that issue, that problem. Um, and we want you to know you're, you're an important part of this team. Correct me if I'm wrong there, but it's really about right. us becoming tighter, which everyone listening, watching this right now, you are a team, right? Just like the military, you're running a little machine. You have, you have little battles, battlefields. You have things, you have, you have angry customers. You have issues in your company, outside your company of threats, all these different things. But if you can take uh, let's, let's take a quick view of what we've talked about. We talked about guarding your company's honor. That's essentially setting your mission and your values. You're going to be able to hire and fire based on that. Made my company way better when we set in stone what are those, and then everybody's on board. Create those bumpers, those guideposts, and that way the, and it really can be your one-word mission, right? I've got a kids program that's a nonprofit. We keep kids safe on social media, 
so they can someday shine online. We make every decision based on that and based on the customer we serve. We know exactly her name, her psychographic name and everything. Focusing on behaviors. What behaviors bring accountability to the forefront? Vulnerability from the top. Leaders, if you're not vulnerable, this is a great chance to just start taking time to find somebody to start opening up. Your employees know your weaknesses. Don't act like you can hide them. They know what they are. If you just say what they are, they're going to like you so much more. Self-awareness, empathy, collaboration, growth, mindset, doing what's right when no one's watching. Because if, by the way, in the social media landscape right now, everybody is watching. They will find out. It will come out. And then a ritual behavior, just always debriefing, talking about the successes, the failures, um, and doing that stuff. Sir, I'm honored that you would be here today. I want to give you last word. What are you telling leaders right now who want to be better at debriefing to win, communicating internally, and really making sure that every one of their missions, their campaigns, whatever they're doing, their projects, is a little bit more successful than the last? Yeah, micro changes now, repeated over time, are going to lead to a cultural shift that's going to be so positive. I mean, don't be overwhelmed by, oh, this sounds too difficult. There's too many steps. Uh, it sounds cool, but in practice, it's going to be hard. Our people aren't capable of this. No, no. Cease and desist all of those negative thoughts. Small changes practiced starting now, incrementally every single day, will lead to the kind of culture that you're looking to have where you've got virtuous behavior from a team that cares enough to try harder and constantly improve. And it's awesome to see take root, period, dot, industry agnostic. In fact, you can cross apply everything we've talked about here into any domain in which you exist because guess what a team is a team is a team i love it thank you so much for joining us here today the rest of you who are listening or watching no matter where you're at we're here to help you build that culture that makes sure that your team can then thrive both in person and especially online at medialeaders.com and that's so that your company can shine online one little thing I want to leave all of you with, one little tidbit is if you are a big company like Cisco and you have a million followers on social media, you also have tens of thousands of employees who combined using their Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram and everything else have way more followers. If you aren't true to the core of your core values of what you are, your employees will complain online. And there's nothing you can say on your company accounts that will outpower the more authentic voice on social media that your employees will complain about it. Whether you're a big insurance company, a technology firm, a lifestyle company, whatever you're doing, if your people aren't happy, uh, it's going to make a bigger impact. Please consider that. You can learn more at medialeaders.com. You can also go to Amazon to buy Debrief to win. Robert Cujo Teschner, I'm so honored that you're here today. Thank you, sir, for your service to America. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Josh. What a pleasure to be here again. So grateful for your friendship. Thank you. The rest of you who are watching and listening, please rate, subscribe, and review. We'll see you all very soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Take care.